Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Because I say my P's too prominently and it makes a P sound, a popping sound. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And what a glorious day it is here in the bounty of nature at Liara's. Thank you, Liara, for having us here. We pause today to acknowledge that First Presbyterian Church of Barrie and many of our homes sit on land which has served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples since time immemorial. The Western Abenaki, the people of the Dawn Land, are the traditional caretakers of these Vermont lands and waters, which they call Indakina, our homeland. We remember their connection to this region and the hardships they continue to endure. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to the Abenaki elders and to the indigenous inhabitants of Turtle Island, past and present. We give thanks for the opportunity to share in the merits of this place and to protect it. We are all one in the sacred web of life that connects people, animals, plants, air, water, and earth. The prelude this morning is by George Milne. This is prelude number four. Um, I'll strive to do it justice. So here we go. <laughs> Allison for that lovely rendition and thank George. Um, it made me wanted to get up and dance, but Joe wasn't here to dance with me, so um, I didn't subject you folks to that again this Sunday. So thank you, Allison, for that beautiful piece and for your wonderful ministry of music. We warmly welcome all of God's children who worship with us today, whether for the first time or the 1,000th time, whether on Zoom or in person. We are delighted to have you with us, and we invite you to return often. For those in person, we invite our guests to let us know of your presence by completing a visitor's card found on the front table. And I hope they're on the front table. If not, I'll make sure they are next Sunday. For those on Zoom, we invite guests to put your names and addresses in the chat space. We would love to stay in touch with all of you and are thankful for your presence with us today. I'm going to do my best on this. We are not alone, nor have we ever been, especially since Carl left over a year ago. God has been with us every step of the way and guided us through this past year and a half. 
I hope you have felt God's presence during this, these times. There have been times that I felt the strength of that love and other times when I have turned away. Regardless, God has been there with me and with all of us. During this time, we've also had the tremendous support of many individuals and groups. We have been blessed with a dynamic and powerful pulpit supply. Leading our service today, we have with us one of our most staunch supporters, Reverend Deidre Ashton. She is one of the finest representatives of that incredible pulpit supply helping us. Uh, and, and forgive me if I butcher this, Reverend Deidre Bacharich. <laughs> wow. Well, it's spelled B-A-C-H like Bach, you know, so I guessed at that. Master of Divinity, retired board certified chaplain, is no stranger to us. She is a spiritual director, a retreat leader, and recently retired as a health care chaplain and PCUSA Minister of the Word and Sacrament. She is a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Deidre served as a parish minister for 20 years and prior to that as summer chaplain at a conference center. She lives just over the hill in Tunbridge with her husband, Chuck. Deidre, I know your schedule made this hard for you to be here with us today, and I thank you for coming. We appreciate your pre presence and your guidance in our service today. The Presbytery of Northern New England has also been with us every step of the way since Carl left. They have helped us behind the scenes with direction in our path to a new minister, with counseling and countless meetings, with leadership and our deliberations on our path, and with support during our flood trials and recovery. The face of the Presbytery has most often been that of the Reverend Dr. Scott DeBlock, who is also with us today. Scott, we are honored to have you helping with our service. Scott is the resource presbyter for the Presbytery of Northern New England of the PCUSA. His current responsibilities include coming alongside pastors and church leaders of PNNE, congregations in their ministry and mission. He has been a pastoral leader for 35 years. From 1995 to 2014, he served as senior pastor of the Niskayuna Reformed Church in New York. He then served as a specialized transitional pastor for churches in Brunswick and Boston Spa, New York, as well as in Newburyport, Mass, and Portland, Maine. He now lives in Portland with his wife of 38 years, Dr. Heidi DeBlock. From there, they travel to visit their three daughters from D.C. to London. And I hope I'm not overstepping uh, when I make the announcement that uh, today, um, Scott has become a grandparent for the first time. So, we know you will have many wonderful years being a, a grandparent. I understand it's easier than being a parent. Um, it is our great privilege uh, today to worship with both of you, and we deeply appreciate all of your help and support, especially over the past year and a half. Thank you. Let us now join in the responsive call to worship. Sometimes, O oh God, we feel like Jacob wrestling with angels. Strengthen us. us. Sometimes we feel battered and broken. Touch oh, us. Sometimes we grow so weary in the struggle. Refresh, Refresh us. us. Together, let us seek the face of the divine. Our opening hymn is number 517 in the purple hymnal. Here, O oh our Lord, we see you face to face. Please stand if you are able or want to, and if not, you know, stay seated.
please be seated. Let us come into God's presence with the awareness that all are in need of God's grace and forgiveness. God is holy and just, and we know we fall short. But God is also gracious to hear, so we can be honest in prayer. Let us confess our sins before God and in the presence of one another. Let's pray together. Gracious God, God of manna in the desert, God who nourished a hungry crowd with loaves and fishes, we admit that we find it difficult to trust your abundance. We hoard what we have because it makes us feel secure. We keep score within our relationships, filing away mental tallies of our own good works and the shortcomings of others. We are happy to follow Christ to a point. And when confronted by the gospel or challenged in our complacency, we make excuses. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to trust your grace that defies logic Help us to live in your extravagant love and boundless mercy. Give us the will to live all of life in service to you, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Indeed, God's love is abundant. God hears our prayers and is gracious to forgive. The cross is for us a reckoning. The debt is paid, the mercy flows out, sufficient for all. Let us claim the freedom we know in Jesus Christ. Friends, believe in the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And to that we can all say, Amen. You're able. This is a wonderful time in the worship service where we get to celebrate who we are as a community in need of peace. Let us pass the peace of Christ with each other. May the peace be with you and you respond with also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that peace. Hey, it's nice to see you in person. Oh, oh, thanks. A little messy. A Peace be with everyone on Zoom. Yes. Peace be with you all indeed on Zoom. We're glad to have you with us across the miles.
Now let us prepare ourselves to listen for God's word. Let's pray. God, we do ask you for your wisdom as we enter into the study of your word today. We know that the scriptures can guide us and lead us into knowing you more. We desire that so greatly, to know you, to know your son, to know the voice of your spirit. May your words bring us life and hope today. In Christ's name, amen. wonderful to be with you again and to share this time and space in this glorious place on this glorious day. And um, so now we will focus our attention on a couple of stories that, you know, like any story out of the Bible, um, sound a little foreign to our ears, don't necessarily make a lot of sense. But just listen as I read first a story from Genesis. I'm reading from chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. Hear the word of God. The same night, Jacob got up and took his wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man, or some translations have it, an angel, wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. The man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. The sun rose upon him, and as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. The second reading is from Matthew's Gospel. And it feels like we're really shifting gears here, and certainly we're shifting centuries. I'm reading from the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him. They followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And he looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples 
and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so after you've heard these readings, these two sort of disparate readings, what I'd like to talk with you about is prayer. And this may not be obvious right now, but we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> so let's start here. Just think for a minute, what is the first prayer you ever knew? What is the first prayer you ever said? For me, it's really clear. Well, actually, it's one of two. I don't know which one it is. So I learned these two at about the same time in my life. And given where I was saying them, I must have been very young. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And later I learned there's another part to that. By his hand we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. But we stopped at the food. The second one didn't make as much sense to me, and it's slightly disturbing. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. So I prayed a lot falling asleep, <laughs> that there wasn't any dying or soul taking. I didn't even know what that meant. Um, yeah, so who was I praying to at that age? I had an idea that there was this being, and this being was God. And I don't know where I got that, because my parents were not churchgoers. But they sent me to Sunday school. So interesting. They would drop me off at the little Methodist church, and I went to Sunday school. And my grandmother and her other daughter and their family were very, very much believers. Um, so I have this sense of, at my grandmother's knee, learning something about God and who Jesus was, but also really in the church. It's the church that taught me. And then there were my Catholic relatives, and they assured me that I had a guardian angel. I had never seen this guardian angel. They told me sometimes you do, sometimes you don't see, usually like when you're falling asleep. Oh, no, if I should die before I wake. <laughs> so, <laughs> angel of death. Anyway. <laughs> So think about, just hold those things as, as we um, travel through the next couple of minutes, several minutes together. Like, where was your first encounter with prayer? What was your first image of God? And what was an angel to you? You know, was it Christmas angels? I was always an angel in the pageant. Never, ever Mary, never the archangel, just an angel. Always, always, always. The guardian angels, the angel on top of Christmas trees, angels from the realms of glory. And how do these angels make you feel? This morning's reading from the Hebrew scriptures tells a story of a terrifying encounter in the middle of the night with a man, or really an angel, probably angel being a messenger of God or an emanation of God. So Jacob, the star of the story, was about to cross into his brother Esau's land. And this shouldn't be much of a problem, right? Except that years earlier, Jacob had cheated his brother out of his inheritance. And let's just say they parted on shaky terms, as in Jacob ran for his life. So this is years in the past. And you know... He didn't know what he was going to encounter when he crossed Esau's land. He knew what he deserved, though. He'd learned a thing or two in the intervening years, and he knew what he probably deserved. He, but he didn't know how this was going to go. So he parked his family and all his goods, and he went off, and he was alone. And he had one of those nights. You might know what I mean one of those restless nights 
one of those nights when you toss and you turn and you're fearful and you're anxious and all the things that are never going to happen happen in that night, in that moment, in your head, in your being. What does the next day have in store? And the story goes that in his half-waking, half-sleeping state, Jacob is seized with anxiety and perhaps is putting out a fervent prayer for protection. I'm reading into this here because that's what I do. <laughs> but I'm imagining if I'm Jacob, that's what I'm doing. I'm praying to this guardian angel I've never seen, and I'm just trying to ward off the death that I'm afraid of. I'm praying. I'm trying to contact God in any way that I can, even if I never talked to God before, even if I don't even know who God is. I'm grasping. And don't you know, some body shows up, a man, an angel, a voice of God, a presence of God, something is there besides Jacob. And rather than greeting each other warmly, they wrestle, they wrestle. Now what's that about? Again, a lot is left to the imagination and mine runs wild. And so I wonder if I'm Jacob, if I'm in his shoes, and I come face to face with the pure light and love of God, I wonder, am I forced to see who I really am? My shortcomings, my failings, am I forced to accept all of that? or try to run away from all of that. I wonder if this is a strange experience of coming to terms with who he has been and what he's done and a sort of a release of the past and acceptance and a release in order to face whatever is going to come to him the next day and he truly does not know what that's gonna be. And in the end, in the end of this wrestling, Jacob bears a scar, a scar of this experience. But also, he's blessed in that. And he gets a new name and a new identity, Israel. He's been transformed in that wrestling. And he steps into this new life. And he's ready now. He's ready. After wrestling with God, after wrestling with whoever this being is, after coming to terms with all of that, he's ready to face whatever is outside waiting for him. And so he wakes up in the morning and he gets ready to go. And he moves on and spoiler alert, things actually go really well. Esau's kind of over it too. So they all move on and Jacob, Israel now, moves into this new place and this new role in his life. So, I said we'd get to the prayer. I wonder if this encounter is a kind of prayer. It's a prayer of facing the darkest parts of oneself, the shadow side, the unsavory bits, accepting them, and resolving not to let them have control over us. Yeah, they're there, you need to know it, but they don't have to rule your life. So there are lots of ways to pray, right? I love the centering prayer, um, just to be in the presence of God. There's the blessing of grace. There's the prayer of intercession. But I also think there's a sort of prayer of wrestling. Now, when I was in high school, I went to a small rural high school in Ohio. There are only 52 kids in my graduating class. But we had in our class the state champion wrestler in Ohio. That is a big deal. <laughs> State champion. So I went to lots of wrestling matches. And here's what I can tell you about wrestling. Besides, I don't really understand it and I don't want to do it. Um, <laughs> what I can tell you is there are, par there are times when these two wrestlers are engaged with each other that things are moving kind of quickly and you almost can't tell who's who. There are arms and legs and things. They're, they're entwined with each other, 
they're really coming to grips with one another. And I think sometimes prayer is like that with God. Imagine being so intertwined with God, you can't tell where you end and God begins, or vice versa. So that's one aspect of prayer. So there are different ways of praying. Centering prayer, intercession, and this wrestling. But there's another bit to prayer that I think is really important. And it's this. It's something that we see that Jacob did. And Barbara Brown Taylor comments on it in her book, Home by Another Way, um, in a sermon she calls Bothering God. And it's a whole different gospel text. But I think her point about prayer is great. And it is be persistent. So Jacob was nothing if, he, if not persistent. He hung on and he kept wrestling until this angel, this man, whoever kind of gave up and released him. So here's what she says. She's talking in this case about a woman, a widow who has no standing in culture or society. She's talking about her being persistent with God and praying and praying and praying and just coming back and doing it over and over again. And she says, she was willing to say what she wanted out loud, day and night, over and over, whether she got it or not, because saying it was how she remembered who she was. It was how she remembered the shape of her heart. And Taylor goes on to link this shaping of the heart with prayer. Then, as now, most people prayed like they brushed their teeth. Once in the morning, once at night, as part of their spiritual hygiene program. <laughs> now, I confess that before I read her sermon on prayer, I just never really thought one way or another about how people in Jesus' day prayed. But I know that in our day, it's certainly easy to fall into that kind of routine when it comes to prayer, if we pray at all. And it's even easier to ditch prayer altogether. After all, how often are our prayers answered to our satisfaction? How often do we get exactly what we ask for, exactly when we ask for it? It's pretty easy to lose heart day after day, night after night, when we earnestly ask for what we need only to have our heartfelt request met with stony silence. A little later in her sermon, Taylor talks about the importance of persistence, saying, you are going to learn to trust the process. She says, regardless of what comes of it, because this process gives you life itself. This process keeps you engaged with what matters most to you. What we ask for in prayer, Taylor writes, keeps our hearts chasing after God, chasing after God's heart. It's how we bother God. And it's how God bothers us back. There's nothing that works any better than that, she claims. Prayer shapes our hearts. It attunes our, our psyches, our souls to God. To God who is our courage, our justice, who is love itself. Prayer is what keeps us grounded in God and in our deepest selves. Now, after 20 years of parish ministry and a number of years as a college, as a hospital chaplain or a conference center chaplain or even as a seminary administrator, I've met plenty of people who talk about praying and not getting any answers and how discouraged they are. And a story that comes to mind, and I don't know if I told this here or not, I can't remember, it's one of my favorite stories, but um, the story of the woman I met when I was a hospital chaplain who was coming to the end of her life. 
And she knew that. And she knew that, you know, now she had finally accepted hospice services, that it was a matter of weeks, not years. And this woman had done everything you could possibly do medically. She had done everything spiritually. She prayed with all her heart. She was surrounded by friends and family at the bedside, singing and praying, and people all over the country were praying for her. And it was just really clear that the prayer for return to 100% autonomy and health was not going to be answered. But at the same time, people would come and visit her. And there were people in her, she befriended everybody. And so there were people in her life who enjoyed being in each other's company and others who did not. And one day, two women from the community showed up at the same time. Two women who hated each other, who could not get along. But because they were coming to visit her, they sort of gingerly made their way to the bedside and ended up being with her in civil conversation with her at the center knowing that it was all about this woman that they both loved. And they ended up leaving there, working together to support her family because they knew the family was going to need a lot in the coming weeks and then after this woman was gone from their midst. So later I had a conversation with this patient and she said, you know, We've been praying and praying and praying and praying for healing. And actually healing came, just not in the way that we thought. But there were healing relationships all around us. Persistence, wrestling, staying engaged. That's what prayer is about. Sometimes just being in God's presence sometimes bringing doubts and fears actually maybe more of the time bringing doubts and fears and angst and things we're angry about have you read the psalms wow <laughs> there it's just one complaint after another punctuated by praise <laughs> that's what god expects us to do bring it all because god brings it all to us and so I offer this to you as this congregation is picking itself up yet again from the thing was, that was sewn out on the bingo card, all right? So you knew you were having, every congregation has a tough time when they move from a, a pastorate of long-term that was healthy and good to whatever it is that's going to come next. And then you get the storm in the middle of it. And so it's like being knocked down, and you get up, and you do it all over again. Something is going to work itself out here. The question is, and the question that I really encourage you to wrestle with each other and with yourselves and with God is, what is the expression of this church in this place and this time? What is the best way to be church to each other, to this community, and to the surrounding region. What is the best way? It might not be the way you did it even a few years ago. That might not be possible. Maybe it is, maybe not. But I encourage you, as you continue this process, this picking up and moving on, to wrestle with what matters most. And if you ask that question, the answer might surprise you. And somebody will come into your midst. There will be a leader. Maybe it's not a traditional pastor. I don't know. <laughs> I've left lots of churches. <laughs> and they do things all sorts of different ways. It's a scary place to be. But I encourage you to continue to be in God's presence. And ask what matters most, what matters most to you, what matters most to God, what matters most to this community. 
and you wrestle with all your heart. Amen. Let's respond by affirming our faith. If you're able, if you so desire, please stand. We put our trust in Jesus Christ who said, I am the bread of life. We are nourished and sustained by God's life-giving spirit. Christ gives life to the world through his broken body and spilled blood. We come to Christ's table to receive his gifts with joy. Christ is our living bread. Thanks be to God. As we come together to celebrate the sacrament of grace, let us sing a hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Oh, I want to mo move this mic so badly. What announcements do we have this morning? Well, I have an announcement. Uh, if there are those of you who um, forgot to bring your bread and wine, um, right up here, we have cups and we have bread. Um, and if you need to come get that now, please come do so. Is there anybody? Would you grab some? Is there anyone else that needs anything? Okay. And there are no more announcements. Um, yes. Um, that was Jan, and she wants to thank um, all the folks from the church that helped support um, her and her sister and her whole family uh, during the flood. 
uh, I had the joy of um, ha helping her sister uh, muck out her house and ran into a young woman that graduated from high school with my daughter. So um, you never know how your prayers are going to be answered or what blessings you're going to get. Um, so uh, that leads us into the um, time that we bring our joys and concerns before God, and this is a joy uh, for Jan and her family and Paula. So um, I'm trying to work on this. I'm going to say, now let us all say together, and then we're all going to say, thanks be to God. Okay, let us all say together, thanks be to God. So for joys, we'll do that. For uh, our concerns, we'll say, hear our prayer, O Lord. Okay, are there other um, prayers that we have joys or concerns? Kathy. Uh, continued prayers for Mariah and Daniel and Morgan. Um, um, the update is that her indigestion was really busy with the baby yesterday, and we put in some paper, but there will be some scheduled prayers. Um, so I suppose I can say this. Um, uh, Diane has asked us to pray for her and her family and her daughter-in-law and son. Uh, their baby is in a breech position. She was going into the hospital yesterday to, I don't know, I guess have, they would move it. Um, and she was not able to do that, is what Kathy is saying. So we need to continue um, prayers for Diane and Jim, for Mariah, for Nathaniel, and for the new life uh, that is coming into their lives. Um, uh, let us all say together, Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Yes, Roxanne. Um, prayer for Rebecca. This is the 12th anniversary of her mother's passing, and it's even though it's been 12 years, it's extremely difficult for her. So this prayer is going to kind of reseal it. So um, Roxanne has asked for prayers for her daughter-in-law, Rebecca. Her mother died 10 years ago. This is her anniversary, and um, we never get over the loss of our parents. And so let's keep her in our prayers and ask God to hold her close to God's heart. Um, let us all say together, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Paula. Hi, Don. Um, also very grateful for the help the church brings. And you, <laughs> one day we're, we're still tired, and I've been asking God for help. And when Dottie got so tired, <laughs> from Maine, and they said two teams of people, so I'd like to thank Giving Prayers for these people who helped us, Team Rubicon from all over the country, they came and helped us as well, and um, the two teams from Maine who came and helped us when we didn't have any help at that time, and so I'm very grateful to all the people who um, came in and Um, so Paula, uh's basement just suffered horrendous uh, damage, uh, very much like the churches. And um, and I tell you, I learned something in doing this. All the people that turned out to help us at our church, um, one was a young woman um, that I called a Mormon. And she said, oh, no, 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 we are not Mormons. We belong to the LDS. And then I would, I would forget and call her Mormon, and she kept reminding me. So I passed that on. The, what we used to know as the Mormon church is now the Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They go by LDS. So Paula is very grateful for the two teams from the LDS or the two people that came and helped her for Team Rubicon, which included volunteers from all over um, the U.S. And uh, she's very grateful for our help, for everyone's help. And um, so let us all say t together, thanks be to God. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I would uh, like to ask for prayers for Peggy Hood. Peggy uh, went to her reunion, and 40 of the people at her reunion came down with the COVID. So um, uh, she's at home, uh, and um, 
you know, let us keep her in our prayers that God will bring her healing and that her time with COVID will be brief and insignificant. So um, let us all say together, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Is there, are there any other prayers? So this week we invite you to keep Jennifer and Thomas Raynaud in your prayers, gracious Lord. We give thanks for them and their presence in this congregation. Hold them in the palm of your hand and let them feel your love. Give them the wisdom and strength to do your will and the faith and courage to face whatever challenges may arise. Let us all say together, hear our prayer, O Lord. As part of being the Connectional Presbyterian Church, we keep in our prayers other ministries within the Presbytery of Northern New England. This week, our prayers are for college and seminary professors. Let us all say together, hear our prayer, O Lord. Okay, I think that we are ready uh, for the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Persistent God, we come to you. And we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily bread and food and health each breath we take, for the power of your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be people who are unafraid to live as fully as you richly and richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word, to take chances by loving those whom others think are worthy only of hate, take chances by de doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us, Lord, be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for the church gathered today, both here and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover and develop and use their gifts. We thank you for those glimpses of how brothers and sisters in Christ have come together to deal in the muck and the mud, to live out our, their faith, to offer help and hope. We thank you for your presence and your guidance with this community in the floods, literal and figurative. And we know that you have a wondrous future in store. Led by your spirit, guided in hope to be your people in this place. Hear the prayers we have mentioned for helps in the floods of our lives. We pray for healing. We pray for those who grieve. Hear our prayers and help us indeed to come to you and wrestle and see you face to face. Hear our prayers in the name of the one who became one of us face to face. And he teaches us now to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What you will hear today is a um, excerpt from Spring into Mezzo. It's a piece by Betty Jackson King, a black woman composer. It was written around 1955. Um, so I I've been playing the music of white men for a very <laughs> long time, so I try to, you know, leaven it with other things. Um, so this is a beautiful Good piece. Choice. This is the time where we sh offer our gratitude to God for the gift of God's grace. So we give our offerings, offerings of service, offerings of financial gifts to support the work and life and ministry of our church in the world. So ponder that and you can place your offerings in the speakers. I think they're right there, right? Can people do that now or later or whenever you want? to place your offerings there and think upon God's goodness to us in this time.
As a little boy offered five loaves and two fish to feed a multitude, we offer our gifts, O God. With your grace, may our gifts be transformed into food, water, and bread, justice, and peace. We offer our gifts this day so that the world may come to rejoice fully in your love, which is given and shared with all humankind. In the name of the generous one, amen. The gospel story this morning is the perfect story for a communion Sunday. Um, we have Jesus going to a lonely place to pray. After an injustice that he was angry about, his cousin had been brutally killed, he went off to a lonely place to pray and probably wrestle with God in his own right. But the crowds came after him and from that place of prayer, from that place of being with God, he came forth and helped the others perform the miracle of feeding all of these people with a few loaves and a few fish. And so, friends, with that story in mind, we know that this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from north and south and east and west to sit at table with God. Our Savior invites all who believe in him, or all who maybe question him, or all who have doubts and fears, all of us, wherever we are on our spiritual journey, are invited to share in this feast. Let us give thanks to God. We praise you, O oh God, that you have set this feast before us. You commanded light to shine out of darkness, stretched out the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth. You made all things through your word, and we thank you for creating us in your image and for keeping us in your steadfast love. We praise you for calling us to be your people for revealing your purpose in the law and the prophets and dealing patiently with our pride and disobedience. We praise you, most holy God, for sending Jesus to live among us, full of grace and truth. He made you known to all who received him. Sharing our joy and sorrow, he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners, and we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. And so, gracious God, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us, the body and blood, the sustenance of our Lord, and that we and all who share this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Fill us with eternal life, that with joy we may be faithful people until we feast with you in glory through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, our creator, forever and ever. Amen. And so, friends, the story goes that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is the bread of life, and it's offered to you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. 
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And so friends, we partake of this loaf and this cup, the bread of life and love. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat, take and drink. And so, friends, having been nourished at this table and prepared for the next step on our journey, let us give thanks. God of grace, you renew us at this table with bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Christ. Amen. And so now I invite you, as you are able or as you are interested, <laughs> to stand as we sing our closing hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excite.
friends, hold on to that last phrase, lost in wonder, love, and grace. May you leave this place lost in wonder, love, and grace, and love one another as God loves you. Go into the world to show and share God's love. Love each other and love everyone. Go forth to be disciples in the world, working for peace and justice. Go to love as the Spirit loves you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.